to uh, it's not quite the six o'clock news, but it's the uh, it's the Wednesday uh, surgical webinar from RCSI, and it's become almost uh, one of these features of the week. Uh, we've become accustomed to it. Ken uh, started it with uh, Kieran and Porik when we were up to our oxters in COVID, and now sadly we're beginning to. Uh, uh, to see the signs that the hospitals are going to find it very difficult to cope in coming weeks if the uh, if the same metrics apply as they did the last time. Uh, I mean, we are almost having as many uh, new cases uh, diagnosed, uh, though it may be that the demographics are, are slightly uh, different and therefore the pressure on the hospitals, we hope, will not be as 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 acute and we hope that the morbidity and certainly the mortality will not be as great as the first time round. But uh, uh, there you are. I remember uh, thinking when we were uh, in the middle of the summer that we were in the eye of the storm and uh, I think oh, only too true. Interesting uh, and good news that four billion euro has been allocated in addition uh, to the health uh, budget next year. Uh, it's an enormous amount of money, uh, and yet, given the um, the demands and the complexities, it will be, uh, well, we hope it will be enough to get us through and to address the uh, long-standing deficiencies, uh, both uh, in the infrastructure and in the personnel that have been there in the uh, in the health service. It uh, it serves no purpose to uh, let it be known that uh, the college uh, and the profession generally have been making trying to make people aware of of these deficiencies for a long time. And certainly in intensive care and high dependency, uh, we are about half the number of beds that we require for a modern health service. So let us hope that this rude awakening uh, um, and very costly awakening will allow us to uh, rebuild the infrastructure such that we will be more resilient. Um, of interest, particularly for this evening, is the announcement of 58 million that will be dispersed to a, a number of projects. But I see um, uh, in, I'm afraid it's not in bold type, it's in ordinary case, uh, but the trauma system. And that really would be an, a very important development if we can get the trauma system up and running. I believe 1.5 million is going to be allocated to that. Now, whether that will be sufficient to get it off the ground or not, I don't know. The other area that is of concern to the college is the allocation of 130 million uh, euro to the NTPF. Very welcome allocation to try and to keep scheduled care on the road. Uh, but we must ensure that this is not at the price of lost training opportunities, uh, because if we don't keep our trainees uh, upskilled and give them experience to the type of cases that would be suitable for NTPF outsourcing, um, we will find ourselves very rapidly uh, not able to progress uh, our trainees in their training. So with those uh, few words and the welcome for uh, the um, budget and the allocation to health, um, I want to uh, welcome our uh, presenters this evening. Uh, Ken Mealy, who is known uh, to us all as our uh, immediate past president, but more importantly now as the co-lead of the National Cancer, uh, the National Clinical Programme for Surgery, and Eamon Rogers, uh, who is the National Clinical Advisor in Urology. We're very pleased that Vita Hamilton um, is joining us uh, from the national HSE uh, standpoint. She's the national clinical advisor and group lead for acute operations in the HSE. So Vita, thank you for taking time to join us this evening. Uh, and then Aaron Glynn is co-chair of the Fracture Liaison Service and is going to give us an update on the trauma and orthopedics uh, situation. And I really think our trauma and orthopedics have done a stellar job um, in um, managing uh, the acute fracture services during uh, the COVID uh, um, episodes earlier in the year. And these have now almost become routine, uh, the new fracture liaison service. So uh, we look forward to hearing that. So Ken, I'd be grateful if you could uh, update us on the uh, clinical program and surgery. I'll leave it to you. Pres President, thank you very much. and. 
it's a real pleasure to be back here again, having uh, not spoken at this forum for, for a number of months. Um, I think uh, what I'd like to do is, is just give, give an update in general terms of where I think we're at. You, you've, you've introduced some of the topics that I'll come back to, President. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I consider is the new normal. Um, and I share your sense of foreboding about what's going to happen in the coming months. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Debbie McNamara, my co-lead, who put together this document with Dr. Vida Hamilton um, and our colleagues in trauma and orthopedics and anesthesia. And, and really, I think it sets out how we should all be behaving now in terms of, of particularly scheduled surgery, but there's also an emphasis here on how we should manage emergency surgery. And some of those key principles, I think, are, are still pertinent to all of us um, in terms of what we all do understand we have to be flexible in what our expectations are, depending on uh, the level of co the prevalence of COVID within our local communities. I think there's been a greater understanding. One of the benefits, if I can say that, of COVID is that we do understand the greater importance of multidisciplinary care. And um, certainly we have talked more with our other colleagues in terms of acute medicine, emergency medicine and anesthesia over the last number of months. So that's a good outcome uh, from, from uh, the, the, the situation we find ourselves in. And this is so important as things change on a week by week basis. Um, huge emphasis on COVID-free pathways. I'll come back to that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, importance of scheduling. Uh, gone are the days when we can have loads of people sitting in our waiting rooms, sitting in our uh, outpatient clinics and sitting in our day wards. We really need to space out people in an appropriate way. And of course, to keep everyone safe, uh, we need uh, an emphasis on pre -COVID, the pre-COVID uh, status of each patient. So can I move on to the next slide, please, Pauline? Um, just looking at that in a bit more detail, um, uh, I think uh, it's so important to emphasize some of the good things that have come about because of COVID. So there's been a huge emphasis on pre-assessment. Uh, and this has been challenging over the years because there's been a variable amount of pre-assessment uh, for surgery in, in so many different hospitals. But many hospitals now have moved to virtual clinics. Many are nurse-led services. Uh, we arrange COVID testing for anybody who is undergoing a general anesthetic. I think there's an acceptance that for patients who are undergoing endoscopy, minor ops, those who do not need a general anesthetic, and certainly those who are not undergoing aerosol generating procedures, they don't need to be COVID tested, but they need to have a series of questions asked uh, uh, to, to make sure that they're not in the high-risk category. And it also gives us a greater uh, ability to have a consent process that's properly structured, uh, including COVID uh, uh, issues, um, particularly for patients undergoing mi minor surgery. Uh, likewise, there has to be a greater emphasis on DOSA. Uh, some of our hospitals around the country have been challenged with DOSA over the last number of years. This is day of surgery admissions. Uh, and really, there is no argument for not organizing DOSA services in the current constraints, uh, not only for bed capacity issues, but also uh, patient safety. Having patients in hospital the shortest possible time has to be so important. I've already alluded to day ward and theater scheduling. And um, one of the reasons we're all constrained and not having got back to our pre-COVID uh, activity levels, and that is because for many of us, uh, our, our day wards, we need to have better scheduling of patients. We need wider spaces between beds and trolleys and likewise in theatre. So we, we, there is a limitation depending on the infrastructure that different hospitals have. I've already alluded to lo local protocols. If one lives in a, an area of a low COVID prevalence, and some of the hospitals are still in areas of lower COVID prevalence, uh, the, the checks and balances that we require may be different uh, to those patients who are coming in in areas of high COVID activity, where uh, COVID testing, for instance, is mandatory under these circumstances. And the last thing I'd emphasize here is, is staff well-being. I think it's really important that we emphasize and pay attention to those working around us. Um, 
we have an onus as surgeons to inform our, our colleagues, particularly anaesthetists and, and nursing staff and theatres, if we're generating aerosols. Uh, there's been a lot of work looked, done looked at, looking at laparoscopy, and there still are issues in relation to safe laparoscopy, uh, having appropriate filters uh, when we're evacuating air uh, from the abdominal or the chest cavities. Um, so that all staff can use the appropriate PPE. So communications, uh, huddles before the uh, theatre list start, and likewise uh, debriefing at the end of the day, and a greater emphasis on the surgical checklist. And we've put an emphasis on uh, COVID status being included on the surgical checklist so that everybody is, is coming off the same hymn sheet. Uh, we've updated our, our care pathway for day case laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So again, Different hospitals do not need to be reinventing the wheel. Uh, we've put the emphasis in this pathway of where COVID checks need to take place. So we've tried to make it easy to, to share the knowledge and learning that some hospitals have got with all others. And we would look forward to feedback from any of the units around the country uh, where they have uh, designed different templates which may be appropriate and which may be appropriate for sharing. Can I have the next slide, Pauline, please? So we sense, uh, I, I share uh, the president's sense of foreboding uh, regarding what's going to happen. Uh, although our, as our ITUs fill up, uh, there is a, a concern that, that perhaps scheduled surgery is going to start slowing down again. This is work from Noel Donnan coming from March of this year, showing that there was about a 50% reduction in all surgery, mainly scheduled care surgery, uh, inpatient and day case. But interesting enough, there's also a, a, a slight drop in emergency surgery, which is a concern. Now, from March, April and May, uh, the data is much the same. The levels of scheduled care surgery is now starting to increase a little bit. Um, and we will have more details uh, when the hype, code, the, the hype data is, 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 um, is uh, included in, in, in the data we have access to in the coming months. Can I have the next slide, Polly? Jerry Kelleher, however, um, has uh, updated some of the information. So this looks at uh, March to the July activity for 2018, 2019 and 2020. And you can see that over this period, there still is a very significant uh, reduction in particularly scheduled care, inpatient again and day case uh, over uh, this prolonged period. And as I say, over June, July, August, uh, scheduled care activity has started to increase, but in the best hospitals, it's still only about 70% of what it was in the pre-COVID era. So uh, it is so important that we use the capacity that we do have, uh, be flexible, um, look at local protocols that suit the, the, the level of COVID that is in the environment so that we don't waste any capacity that we have, understanding that the coming months are going to be more problematic. Uh, next slide, uh, Pauline. So uh, really, where are we now? And I think we, we've said this on quite a number of occasions. If COVID has taught us anything, it has taught us that we have to separate the elective from the scheduled uh, surgical streams. Uh, we really need protected surgical resources for day beds, theatre, the ICU and theatre staff. And the, the two big areas of uh, uh, concern for us are if the ICUs become overwhelmed with COVID patients, invariably, and this is what happened last time, uh, the theatre nurses uh, were taken out uh, to run uh, emergency I ICU beds, either in theatres or in other facilities. And even if there are additional ICU beds created around the country, it is likely that the theatre nurses are the ones who will be upskilled uh, to run these. So we will lose capacity in our operating theatres. And if our day beds um, get overrun because of increases in emergency care, this is the other area that we're, where we lose capacity. So if in the long term, if this is thought as anything, we have to separate the acute from the elective uh, streams. Uh, the president has alluded to the private sector, and, and I include here a declaration signed by the four presidents indicating that we believe that the private sector is appropriate for, for training purposes 
And I know uh, the president of, DISC, uh, of RCSI with the presidents of the other training bodies in Ireland have had some preliminary contact with others in the HSE and also with the Medical Council, indicating that this is an appropriate way forward. And really, we do need to consider as a matter of urgency that if there are formal arrangements made with the private sector, that the teams, the surgeons and anaesthetists can bring their teams and engage in not only patient care, but, but training opportunities. Um, in the long term, Sláinte Care has some of the solutions because there are Sláinte Care committees working on uh, elective care hospitals, which are in the capital development plan and in the Sláinte strategy. However, this is nothing that is going to help. This is not going to help us in the short term. Uh, these uh, hospitals are going to take uh, two to three years and more uh, to, to actually uh, uh, develop. Uh, I've indicated issues about training, and I think this is uh, vitally important, as I say. So in the long term, uh, one would hope to see training across the public and the private sectors. And I think in my final slide, Pauline, um, uh, rather than end on, on a really negative note, I think there are positives that have come about uh, uh, regarding the COVID pandemic. Um, there have been benefits, and, and those benefits relate to the new ways of working. I've already alluded to uh, multi -team, uh, multidisciplinary team working. Uh, in, in my opinion, in my own hospital, multi-team working, in addition to working with our administrative staff, has been far stronger over the last six months because of necessity. And building on these relationships, one would hope to see this continue into the future with stronger leadership at management and clinical levels, uh, promoting better care and a more efficient care for our patients. Uh, so some of the examples are the outpatient department rationalizations that have taken place, virtual clinics, um, uh, and I would hope to see ongoing work with OSPIP, that's the Outpatient Services Performance Improvement Program, to see how we uh, engage and get more uh, streamlined uh, admission processes into our outpatient clinics. And the classical example of these, and, and Eamon Rogers may allude to them, are see and treat models. Instead of bringing patients back to our clinics three or four times, a one-stop shop that allows patients contact with the hospital just on one occasion. So we really need to, to declutter our hospitals. And that means having patients come on fewer occasions and dealing with patients to a greater extent virtually by letter, by email, or, and, and those means. I've already alluded to pre-admission planning. Uh, this is much stronger now, working in conjunction with uh, uh, the um, anesthetic anesthesiology program. I, I think we really need to enforce the importance of this uh, around the country. And I, I do believe that the way forward are for nurse-led clinics, virtual clinics, uh, going through the process uh, in addition to anesthesiology clinics for those patients who are higher at risk, particularly ASA3 uh, patients. Uh, and, and again, uh, as I say, th these have improved, uh, in my opinion, over the COVID period. Physical spacing, clearly uh, by necessity now, we have greater physical spacing. And of course, this is more comfortable for patients. Um, it, it improves um, uh, patient comfort. It allows for speaking confidence with patients uh, to a greater extent. And what one would like to see this in conjunction with some of the infrastructural changes that we're all seeing uh, with some of the money that has been uh, poured into the health service to improve the infrastructure in this regard. I think there are important patient safety issues. Uh, I've alluded to consent. Uh, I think there are greater, there's a greater emphasis on consent now because we have to discuss COVID issues with patients. I think I have alluded to the safe site surgery. I think a greater emphasis on this because we can use that as part of the COVID uh, safety issues. And what one would like to see because of the spacing and scheduling uh, a reduction in health uh, associated infections uh, in the future, but that remains to be seen. Uh, and I, I've indicated new funding opportunities. Many hospitals have been offered funding uh, to provide infrastructural support uh, in, 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 as a response to COVID. And I think it would be a, a real shame uh, if we don't show clinical leadership around the country and indicate where we believe these resources 
um, uh, uh, should be uh, uh, spent. And in, in just a small example, in my own hospital, we, we hope to have an acute surgical assessment unit built uh, with COVID funding, and we have had agreement for funding for a new endoscopy unit on the, on the basis that uh, the old unit was not fit for purpose. Opportunities out there. There are challenges, however, uh, we've alluded to the waiting list. I think the, the near future has to be the private sector um, for low acuity work and as professional bodies, I think we would all like to be involved in, in, in that in terms of um, providing training opportunities for, for our trainees. A real worry is the delayed diagnosis of surgical diseases and that this is not just cancers. I know in the UK it is estimated that perhaps 30,000 cancers have been delayed in diagnosis. In, in Ireland, uh, that's proportionally the same. Um, I know talking to individuals in relation to our uh, breast, cervical uh, and colon cancer screening programs, which hopefully are going to come back on board very soon, uh, we know uh, historically uh, there are six, seven, eight hundred cancers across these specialties that have not been diagnosed as a consequence of the delay in screening. So, so we really need to encourage uh, our colleagues to get back on board once these programs are up and running. And finally, the, I, I just want to say a few words about the acute care because I think there is an onus on, on all clinicians to understand uh, that patient flow is so important in our EDs. Uh, again, we can't have situations where we have trolleys lined up in casualty departments. Uh, it was always intolerable, but it is particularly intolerable now. And I think there has to be a greater emphasis on uh, patient streaming, ED streaming, um, work on the acute floor. And at a later date, uh, we would hope to get Paul Ridgway back to talk about the acute floor and developments and acute surgical assessment units. But the way forward has to be to stream patients away from the ED, a more rapid assessment by senior decision makers um, so that patients can be processed or have self-day discharge, have a day, same day discharges as appropriate to improve patient slow. So I think there's uh, an onus on all of us clinic clinically to engage in these processes as a consequence of the COVID pandemic and look upon some of the benefits in terms of funding new opportunities and multidisciplinary working and, and ways of working. So that's, that's my understanding of where we are now. Um, uh, I can't say I look forward to the future, uh, but I do believe there is a role for all of us uh, to engage in some of the things I've discussed, and I'd be happy to engage in, in any questions or any uh, comments that anybody uh, listening may have. Thank you very much. And thank, uh, you, thank you very much. Very much. Sorry. Yeah. Good. Uh, the echo's gone. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ken. I mean, clearly you've got a uh, your finger on the pulse, and and uh, we're very grateful to you for your work in, in this regard. Um, those of you who have questions, best thing to do is to put them on the chat. Uh, um, if you can text them in to us, we can put them to Ken. I'm going to come back later on to, to talk about uh, maybe the access to investigation CT MRI, which uh, has always been an issue that just delayed, delayed uh, discharge. Um, discharge delay planning uh, discharges, uh, what what we're we doing, because there's no way we can actually close the, uh, the indoor. And the problem is we've always had difficulties in getting people out uh, at the other end. And then issues perhaps uh, Vida will be able to help us with um, regarding patient records, electronic patient records and standard information and clinical pathways been available uh, to be disseminated uh, throughout the health service. So I, I'm pleased to ask uh, Eamon Rogers, uh, who is the National Clinical Advisor in Urology and who has done really remarkable work uh, with the Clinical Pathways and Programme in Urology, which has proven very successful and um, has, um, I think, uh, gone a long way towards um, managing uh, the, low, the, the low complexity but very common issues in urology uh, that have bedeviled the health service. Eamon. Thank you very much, uh, Professor O'Connell, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak this evening. 
Um, I suppose uh, just to echo what has been said already, I, I was a pretty busy urologist doing prostate cancer. And since I joined the clinical program uh, in surgery, I can confidently say I'm a wiser uh, urologist than I was before I joined. Uh, it's been a, a very a bit, a good learning experience. And I hope, to, I hope to share some of that learning with you now. And I want to thank my leads, Professor McNamara and Ken Mealy, and also the former leads, uh, Frank, Professor Keane and Professor Highland for their input, and not least my colleagues from other specialties who have been invaluable. Uh, I think the, the opportunity to work with other specialties has been absolutely um, transformative. So um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, we're a busy specialty, uh, urology. We're the fourth busiest specialty in terms of demand uh, as evidenced by waiting lists. And we're getting busier. Um, the reason is that uh, some, some of this is down to good news. Um, prostate cancer is uh, the survival of prostate cancer and indeed most urology cancers and even recent evidence from the National Cancer Control Programme is, 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 is improving. It has improved dramatically. But as we improve urological cancers were dealt with, uh, and would be it with surgery or radiation, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, you know, comorbidities and lifestyle survivorship issues, I suppose you call them, um, impact on sexuality, urinary incontinence, hematuria, they increase our workload significantly. And another factor is that um, there's demographics. Um, it's been predicted by the Irish Longitudinal Aging Study, and this is reliable Irish data that incontinence is going to become more prevalent than hypertension in about 20 years. So urology services are going to continue to, in, to be in demand and increase. And we can see this next slide, please. This is a busy slide, but if we look at the, uh, this is a slide that projects the workload for urology services up until 2051. I'm very grateful to Jerry Keller for giving, giving this projection, which is, again, if you can just take the middle of the slide, you see the brown bar. The, the workload is going to increase absolutely exponentially among those that live more than 65 years of age. In other words, the biggest demographic challenge for urology is age. And of course, all the uh, public health data says people are living longer. But of course, we all want to live longer with quality of life, not living in with incontinence or, 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 or other uh, significant urological issues. So the workload is projected to essentially double by 2051. And of course, are we ready for this? Um, next slide, please. Well, right now, let alone about 2051, we're struggling to meet what's coming in the door to us at the moment as a, as a profession. Again, please bear with me on this slide. As you can see, very in very simplistic terms, we're in the red zone. We can't meet the demand for urological services. And if there's one message from this slide, and it's the top orange line, we're, it's now estimated that we're not able to actually see 5,000 patients who have urological needs per year, as of now. And even if we had, uh, you know, uh, obviously it's good to hear there's more money coming, but to actually meet the demand, we're going to have to see these 5,000 patients. That's going to generate more inpatient work. It's going to require more manpower. And where are we going to do it? So the challenge is now, let alone in 2051. Next slide, please. And yet, as Professor O'Connell said, um, we're a kind of a two-headed uh, animal as a specialty. Um, we're, we're known for high end. We have five cancers to deal with. We're, we, uh, are, we, robotic surgery has become the mainstay of management of most urological cancers. We deal with the most common male cancer, prostate cancer. We have a lot of reconstruction and, uh, and of course the survivorship, but 5% of all procedures, and this is from, this is from national waiting lists. 5% of all urological procedures are described as high acuity but 95% can be done in day case wards and 65% of the low acuity is ambulatory, flexible cystoscopy. So it, our profession is changing. As I say, we're, we're looking at two road, divergent roads. We, we are blessed with high-end, very well-trained uh, 
urological uh, surgeons. Our survival rates are comparable to any international metric, as I've said earlier, but we have a truckload of low acuity work and we are clearly, as I said earlier, struggling to meet this. Next slide, please. This is a very busy slide, but it's probably the most important slide I'm going to show this evening. And it tells us what's going on in urology. This is the basically as is. This is the referral pattern across our hospital groups for urological services. Now, if I can take my own hospital group, SALTA, as an illustration, the bulk of referrals are going to Galway, to the University, to University College Hospital Galway, almost 5,000, with very minimal uh, referrals to the other allied hospitals in our group. If you look at our CSI group, the bulk of referrals go to Beaumont. Similarly, Southwest, it's Cork University Hospital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the bulk of the work in urology, the bulk of the demand for urology services is going to the busiest hospitals, the Model 4s. And of course, why would that be? Well, that's where the urologists are. It makes perfect sense. If you want to find a urologist, you're most likely to find them in a Model 4 hospital. But Model 4 hospitals, we all know, are totally challenged. They're the ones doing the high acuity cancer, doing the high acuity reconstruction, and they're most challenged for beds and intensive care services, not least post-COVID. So in other words, we're feeding into a, a hospital system that's struggling to do high acuity work, let alone low acuity work. Please. So in 2019, there was 42,000 odd referrals for urology services. 73% of those referrals went to Model 4 hospitals, or nine Model 4 hospitals. And if we just look at the, in 88% of urology services are going to 12 hospitals in the country. The nine Model 4s, Mercy in Cork, which does a lot of oncology, Connolly and Letterkenny. But these hospitals, particularly the Model 4s, as I say, are focused on high acuity urology. And if you look at the waiting lists in these hospitals for outpatient, inpatient, daycare and radiology services. Furthermore, 92% of our workforce, now this is a pretty fluid workforce, but at this time, 35 of the 38 urologists were, uh, in the country were working in those 12 hospitals. So very simply, the service is not designed to deliver efficient care of the 95% of patients who need low acuity managing of urological disease. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, just to following the COVID, this has really inflamed the situation. As I said, we're already struggling to see 5,000 patients per year. As Ken has shown, this has gone up. Uh, the demands have gone up post COVID. In fact, the cancer detection rates as of in September are down 20% compared to other years. And that reflects probably the fact that patients are not presenting and we're struggling to get services. So the majority of referrals for urology services, which are mainly low acuity, as Professor Collins says, are inefficiently managed in our current system. We need additional manpower and facilities to maintain or improve urological health now and in the future. Of course, that's blindingly obvious, but what does that actually mean? Next slide, please. And on top of, sorry, on top of that, we we're supposed to see, for example, hematuria within 28 days, we have national prioritization standards, which you can imagine is adding further to our angst in seeing uh, patients efficiently. Next slide, please. So I mentioned everybody knows we need more manpower. Everybody knows we need more facilities. But, you know, is more urologists and Model 4 hospitals really the answer? It can't be. So. We've developed, this was the one of the issues identified by the model of care in your, um, for urology, which of course uh, is, has been developed with the, by the National Clinical Program. And the basic question is, can we change the way we do business? Next slide, please. So what does manpower mean? Well, we're struggling to get consultants. And if we're going to get enough urologists to deal with uh, these issues, we have to hope. We need more urologists, undoubtedly, but we must turn to allied health professionals 
advanced nurse practitioners, nurse specialists, physiotherapists, primary care physicians with special interests. We need help working as part in a partnership with proper surgical governance. But we need, this is where I see a ready-made manpower resource. We need to start using our Model 2 and 3 hospitals more efficiently. And indeed, I would argue uh, we should be moving a lot of the Model 4 referrals out to these. And even post-COVID, why not use primary care centres? Next slide, please. So, but, but again, that's all very well in theory, but how do we apply this? How can we make this work? So we decided we would actually, apart from talking about it, we would actually look at this model, see could we develop a model that might work addressing the manpower and resource issues. So the first thing we needed evidence. So the, first, the basic question is, what actually comes into a urology outpatients? Remember, patients don't come in with prostate cancer or bladder cancer. They come in with symptoms. So if you look at, based on in a sale to the model four, the most common change is prostate cancer, well handled now by the rapid access prostate symptom. But after that, on the left hand side there, hematuria is one of the most prevalent symptoms. And visible hematuria, 10% have cancer. So that's, that's the chest pain of urology. The next most prevalent symptom was non-prostate cancer, male lower urinary tract symptoms. And the third most prevalent condition was incontinence and urinary infection. So if we could address those three symptoms with some form of strategy, we should, in theory, be able to reduce the waiting list. Next slide, please. So we decided to develop treatment plans based on what came in to the, uh, it was on the waiting list. And we developed this, first of all, in Letterkenny. We looked at those waiting in 15 months and longer in Letterkenny, a Model 3 hospital. And what we decided was we approached the community uh, uh, health officers for diagnostics in the community. And to the great credit of the CHO in that region, the Northwest, we were we, we were given a budget to have ultrasound. As Dan Kelly, the great urologist said, ultrasound is the urological stethoscope. And if we had availability of ultrasound, we could make clinics more one stop. One of the madnesses of our system is patients come in to be told they must wait for a diagnostic. If we can come in with a diagnostic, it makes more sense. We can make better treatment and more informed decisions. Then we referred some to see and treat. These are mainly hematurias. Uh, we, we referred people to patients to advanced nurse practitioners under the governance of the urologist. So they didn't come to, to a regular clinic. They went straight to a continence advisor or a nurse practitioner, bearing in mind hematuria, LUTs, and continence. And we also developed a shared care plan with primary care specialists. And we, we did this in Model 2 and Model 3 hospitals. And if I can, uh, next slide, please. So did this work? So look, and what was the result of this? Well, again, just if we can divide this pie chart into three, 37% had to be seen. These were mainly men with genital disorders, particularly needed circumcision. Obviously, we had to see them before we could initiate surgery. But 29%, we were able to see with the availability of an ultrasound. And these are mainly urinary infections. If urinary infections, all we want to know is make sure that it's, it's most urinary infections are acute non-obstructive cystitis or panophritis. So we just needed the ultrasound to make sure there was no obstruction. And then the remainder were a combination of C and treat direct to endoscopy. But by doing this, if you look at the left-hand third, so 20, 30% were seen one stop because we had the ultrasound, and another 30% didn't even go on a waiting list for various reasons that went directly to cystoscopy. So they were removed from an outpatient waiting list. Next slide, please. So did this work? Well, this graph showed that it did work. We, 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 we hammered the 15 month waiting list, but we also started using this prospectively in Letterkenny. So using that same method, direct to see and treat, one stop with a diagnostic, referral to nurse-led clinics with urological governance. We found that using that model prospectively, the 12-month waiting list, 
the six month waiting list, that's the green dot on those slides where we intervened with this model, all fell prospectively. So this is a sustainable model that had a visible sustained impact on waiting lists. Next slide, please. So if this worked in a model three, could it work in a hospital group? So thanks to our colleagues in the HSC and scheduled care, and particularly whom uh, I have uh, a great debt to, have been very helpful. SAILTA has been given the pilot to develop a C and treat model for hematuria, shared care initiative with male lower urinary tract symptoms and continence to be seen by uh, advisors and physiotherapists rather than directly for urologists. And I'm going to concentrate in the interest of time just on the hematuria model. Next slide, please. So if just looking at hematuria, going back to my slide about what presented to the hospitals, well, approximately 13 to 21 percent, let's say 15 percent of all referrals to urology outpatients are. So if we just have a model where they go directly for their diagnostics, mainly imaging of the kidneys and cystoscopy, they never turn up on a waiting list. So you're saving potentially at least 15% of outpatient appointments immediately. Next slide, please. This is a busy slide. We actually have evidence. This model was developed in SAILTA using Roscommon Hospital. It's a model two hospital. It had a, uh, we had the, we were able to access endoscopy and we're, but more importantly, we were able to access imaging. Visible hematuria needs CT scans, microscopic hematuria needs ultrasound. Now this was pre COVID, but if I can just, what was the results? By, this was a direct see and treat model. So the patient had their imaging and their camera on the one day, never turned up at a clinic. The letter came in and the, my consultant colleagues referred it straight to this model. 70% of the patients who presented with hematuria were discharged to their GP after their one visit. 10% had cancer and 20% had other urological pathology, which was benign, such as stones. But 70% and all of these were seen within 26 days on average. So not only did we stop outpatient referrals for hematuria, we actually saw them within the national prioritization claim. Now again, this was pre-COVID. So another important, there was 400, this is based on, this is results of 419 patients and the, the numbers have increased. The last line on the right is also important. The traditional model for hematuria was four visits. Letter came in, waited for an outpatients. When they were in the outpatients told you need to get a CAT scan, you waited for that, radiology waiting list. You waited for your endoscopy, camera endoscopy waiting list. And then because you could have had your cystoscopy and the CT wasn't done, you had to come back to another outpatients to be processed. Four visits, whereas 70% of the patients, 293, only had one visit. Next slide, please. Not only this, but there was a cost benefit to this. And this is from um, our man, um, management in sales to tell me that, that uh, I, I'm not sure the validity of this figure, but I'm told it costs about 120 euros for every patient who attends an outpatient. So if we saved 827 visits, we saved the health service almost 100,000 euro, as well as getting down the waiting list. Next slide, please. I think in the interest of time, um, this. We can just very quickly, male LUTs using a simple shared care initiative with GPs, 85% using the International Prostate Symptom Score. 85% of patients can be triaged and need not even come to a clinic. So we've developed a shared care initiative, and if they do need to come, it, they go to an advanced nurse practitioner. And this again fits very nicely with Slaunch Care philosophy. Um, the, the, the next slide, please. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Incontinence. As I said, this is a real tsunami. The cost to put most, the, the current 
effect of current treatment of incontinence is essentially nappies, which is absolute failure. The psychosocial fallout from that is incalculable. It costs 664 euros per person to keep someone in nappies. Whereas if you brought in nurse practitioners and continence nurse advisors, it only cost 247 euros. This is Irish data and it's supported by NHS data. So when it, I'll conclude with that. So again, I think we can change the way we do business. We need to develop one-stop concepts. And one of the lessons I would stress, and it was mentioned earlier, we need access to diagnostics. That's a challenge post-COVID, but we need access to community diagnostics. And I believe the NTPF are really pushing this now. But with community diagnostics, we can develop one-stop, see and treat, shared care initiatives, using our allied health professionals, using our Model 2 hospitals or past primary care centres. I think, and certainly in where urology is going, given the, the demographics we're facing, this has to be the way forward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eamon. Um, I think you have uh, made a very uh, persuasive argument that we should not wait for uh, the uh, SALTA uh, data to be mature. I think you already have the data, uh, and uh, really uh, this is something that needs to be rolled out nationwide and uh, that other disciplines uh, should take uh, cognizance of what you've achieved and to try and emulate it. I know an ENT head and neck, they're certainly trying to do similar um, uh, in terms of using uh, level two and level three hospitals uh, to provide uh, care and reduce waiting this. Can I ask uh, Vida Hamilton, who is the uh, national NHS, uh, the uh, HSE, <laughs> there's a faux pas, the national HSE lead uh, uh, for a uh, clinical advisor and group lead for acute operations. Vida, you've had a lot to think about there and we look forward to hearing your comments. Um, so, um, sorry now, do you want me to do my presentation now or just to comment on, on what's been presented so far? Uh, Vida, I'll leave it entirely to you. Okay, well, why don't I run through my presentation because I think the, the, towards the end it uh, it, it joins up a little bit. Perfect. So, um, uh, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me this evening. Um, just give you a, a little bit of an update on uh, where we're at um, from an acute hospital's point of view. And um, well, look, as you all know, um, uh, we're in, a, in the midst of a COVID-19 uh, pandemic and we've exponential rise in cases. And in fact, the number of cases today is a thousand. Um, and uh, this is a, the, the weekly rise in our cases. Um, I'm show, what I'm showing you here is the community uh, positivity rate, comparing our second surge here with the first surge. And you can uh, see in Vida, terms we're of- not, Vida, sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing your slides. Uh, can you share your screen or are they uh, available from RCSI? Um, sorry now, my apologies. Um, are you able to see them now? Uh, not yet. Vida, do you want me to share them for you? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, because no um, yeah, sure. Okay. That, that's not working, no? OK, so. Thanks everyone for your patience. Um, so just a quick uh, uh, update on our um, pandemic status. So uh, this uh, shows the exponential uh, rise in the number of cases, and this is the weekly number. And just uh, if you aren't already aware, uh, the case number, as I said, is a thousand today. Next slide, please. Um, and this is uh, comparing the current surge in terms of community positivity rates with our first surge. Um, and you can see that we are uh, looking to exceed the, the positivity rate in this uh, second surge. Next slide. Um, but the difference between the second surge thus far has been um, the difference in the age profile, as was mentioned earlier. But as you can see um, at the bottom of the slide, uh, the 
that heat map in week 40. So um, on the vertical axis, we have the weeks and on the horizontal axis is the age groups affected. And you can see that we've gone from a um, prevalence that was mainly in the 19 to 24s that we now our red zone is extending from 13 uh, to 65 um, and starting to. So it's moving into the older population. Um, with the uh, currently we've a 3% um, admission rate to the acute hospitals. Um, so translation from positivity in the, in the community to acute hospitals. Um, but if uh, it continues, uh, the age profile continues to change, we can expect that uh, admission rate to increase. Um, so the average age is 32 and the median age is 35 at the moment. Um, next slide. Um, and our hospital uh, admission rate, of course, uh, is also e exponential. Next slide. And for those of you who are interested in process control uh, charts, you can see that there's a, a significant uh, uh, increase in the number of hospital admissions. Next slide. Um, and this uh, gives you uh, the comparison of the um, admitted admitting slope uh, compared with our first surge. So you can see there was a much steeper rise with our first surge. And whilst there's been a slower uh, upslope, um, it's now uh, started uh, to, to enter the range um, in terms of admissions. Next slide. And, uh, and of course, there's been a uh, in the first surge, our primary, uh, our epicenter was all in the east coast and primary the Dublin and the greater Dublin area, but there's much greater geographical spread um, in this uh, second surge. And as you're all aware, we have widespread uh, community uh, uh, spread or uh, widespread community transmission, and the border um, counties are particularly affected. But we also have. Um, a lot of activity in Cork and indeed a lot of activity in the Kerry area too. Next slide. Um, our ICUs um, are uh, managing fine and we're continuing to uh, deliver on complex uh, elective surgery and providing post-operative critical care. There are 31 uh, cases um, in ICU at the moment, um, but that is also um, rising. And if the rates continue, um, we would anticipate um, that we would have within two weeks between, you know, at the same rate, um, within two weeks, we'd have between sort of 400 and 700 uh, admissions to um, the acute hospitals and, you know, up to 50 patients in ICU. And that then will start to impact because we'll always have our baseline um, admissions uh, uh, for non-COVID reasons and non-surgical reasons too. And um, so then we'll start to see impact, uh, routine impact on our elective care um, if we don't get control. Next slide. Um, our critical care admissions are made up of confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases, but also suspected uh, COVID-19. And this, these are important as well because they have the same complexity of care and uh, in terms of PPE usage and clinical management as COVID-19 patients. Next slide. Um, and then this just so shows the, the upslope um, comparing it with the first surge. Next slide. And um, the uh, uh, second surge has uh, taken grip in the whole of uh, Europe um, at this time. Next slide. So um, Ken um, mentioned earlier the scheduled care guidance and there are going to be some uh, minor amendments to the guidelines just to bring us in line with the EU. Uh, previously um, the ECDC had defined uh, low incidence as being less than 20 cases per 100,000 of the population and that's the 14 day incidence and um, this has just been amended to 25 cases and um, 
the recommendation is that with appropriate risk uh, assessment that testing is generally not required if the incidence is less than 25 and um, but that if the incidence is greater than 25 and um, that testing would be required for all hospital admissions and that is a testing strategy that's going to NEFA this week um, for review so we can anticipate that that um, uh, that there may well be a change there. Um, there there's also a recommendation that each hospital has a, a, a COVID preparedness committee or equivalent that reviews the prevalence and uh, helps guide the hospital's uh, testing strategy. Next slide. Um, and um, as Ken mentioned, testing is a just a minor part of the overall strategy for managing a scheduled care services. One of the biggest and uh, most important elements, of course, is reducing the patient's um, exposure risk because testing only tells you that virus isn't detected at that period in time. And indeed, the test itself uh, um, has about a 30, uh, 70 percent uh, pickup rate. Um, the, so patients are advised to um, to restrict their movements for 14 days in advance of a admission for scheduled inpatient services uh, surgery and um, and the purpose for that is to reduce their exposure risk and the risk of having um, uh, contracted COVID-19 and therefore be admitted with undetected um, COVID-19 um, and and that's the key intervention um, and as I said, this can be supplemented by testing in uh, when the um, geographical incidence is greater than 25 per 100,000 of the population. But the risk of structured risk assessment form that's pictured here um, identifies patients to see if they have symptoms and also it ensures that the patients do not have an exposure risk and for planned admissions if a patient is symptomatic or indeed has a significant exposure risk uh, the recommendation is that that uh, procedure be deferred um, for the 14 days um, uh, period next slide um, so the and there's the recommended recommended uh, laboratory uh, test for um, testing is the PCR for the RNA, and if the patient reason their surgery is cancelled and they're discharged home, if they um, are readmitted in excess of three days, they should uh, from the first test uh, they should be retested if testing is part of the patient pathway. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, the management of the inpatient pyrexia is crucial here. I think um, particularly in the current climate of high circulating uh, levels and um, that all um, inpatient pyrexias need to be treated as COVID-19 until proven otherwise. And just to be uh, cognizant of the fact that there are common uh, symptoms and signs that we're all very familiar with, with the cough, the shortness of breath and the loss of smell and taste. Um, but COVID-19 has less common um, a, a presentations as well. So particularly in the elderly, it can be with reduced cognition, reduced functionality and very non-specific uh, signs and fevers necessarily a feature. Um, but also a common uh, presentation that gets missed is people presenting with gastroenteritis and it turns out to be COVID-19. And of course, these patients uh, are frequently, if, uh, if there's associated abdominal discomfort get admitted onto the open surgical ward and this has been associated with a, a number of hospital outbreaks. So if a patient um, becomes unwell with an infection as an inpatient, uh, they should be treated as COVID-19 until proven otherwise. They should be isolated, appropriate PPE used and tested. And if the virus is uh, not detected and another cause, including the microorganism, is identified, then de-escalation can occur. But if the virus is not detected and another cause is not confirmed, they should be remain, remain in escalation. And if available, uh, infectious diseases or clinical microbiology uh, opinions sought before they're de-escalated. Next slide, uh, please. 
So um, in terms of unscheduled care guidance, some interim uh, guidances uh, have been issued in the last couple of weeks, and these will be subject to updating based on feedback uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, not for substantial changes, but just to uh, to add from um, uh, people ex uh, people's experience of implementing the guidance uh, to improve on the guidance. A um, big part of uh, the unscheduled care guidance is having a navigation hub, which brings uh, right to the front door a senior decision maker who will stream patients uh, based on a structured risk assessment into COVID or non-COVID pathways. And of course, the non-COVID pathways, uh, there can be a number of branches of that, including the surgical assessment unit. And um, but we also have to recognise that there will be patients with surgical presentations will be placed on the COVID pathway. So um, surgical uh, staff who are um, uh, attending the acute floor and uh, need to be uh, make themselves available to see patients both in the COVID and non COVID pathways. Um, next uh, slide, please. So there are three um, groups. Um, uh, in general that present uh, patients with symptoms and signs consistent with COVID-19, uh, patients with non-COVID-19 presenting complaints, but who have been potentially exposed to COVID-19 and could be incubating the virus. And these need to go on um, protected pathways. Um, and patients with non-COVID presenting complaints who have uh, minimal exposure risk and uh, therefore are unlikely to be incubating the virus. And these patients could go on a non-COVID uh, pathway. Um, one of the um, problems that's going to arise is our escalation strategy in the acute floor uh, previously has been that we um, put people on trolleys within the uh, elements of different elements of the acute floor, be it the emergency department or the AMAU as borders, and then <clears throat> uh, putting additional beds or trolleys um, on the wards to try and decompre decompress the acute floor. But of course, uh, overcrowding um, like that uh, isn't compliant with the current guidance for physical distancing, for infection prevention and control. So there are only two ways that we can um, address that um, disconnect. One is by uh, maximising patient flow, and the other is by increasing the uh, floor space of the acute floor. So the big key thing, I suppose, uh, for maximising patient flow and reducing the patient uh, experience time is ensuring that a senior decision maker, and by this I mean a, a, a registrar or above, um, sees the patient as soon um, as to referral time as possible. And I think the era of saying that I, I don't see patients until their blood results or their x-ray or their whatever uh, test is back uh, is gone. I think that uh, we need to make ourselves available to see patients as soon as possible, that uh, surgical and medical staff who are assigned to uh, see patients in the acute floor uh, need to have their duties um, uh, dedicated to that role and not have competing responsibilities such as surgical lists or outpatient lists uh, so that they can uh, see patients in a very timely fashion and shorten the time to decision to discharge or decision to admit and to, to make sure that uh, that patient experience time is, is minimised. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, maximising patient flow, minimising the patient experience time. Uh, our acute floor need to review their uh, floor space and identify COVID and non-COVID areas so they can deliver on separated uh, pathways. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just these two guidelines uh, are now published and are available on the um, clinical um, clinical design repository from the CCO's office. Um, next slide, please. And so, uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, sometimes um, good things, if you like, arise out of uh, catastrophic situations and um, we've a historically uh, large budget and, and with that comes the responsibility not to squander this 
4 billion opportunity. And I think that the clinical programs have a really crucial role to ensure that this money is spent in a way that visibly benefits patients, both in terms of the volume of patient care that's uh, delivered, but also the quality of patient care that's delivered. Uh, and and uh, I've made that very clear, uh, in fact, in, in acute operations. And there are two big uh, deficits that we have capacity and we will have uh, by the end of next year an expansion of acute beds by over a thousand. So that's a 10 percent increase in our acute bed capacity. That includes um, increasing our critical care beds uh, from a baseline of 255 to, um, gosh, I'll, I'll, I'll forgetting my sums now, um, to uh, 321 by the end of next year. And that's the first phase. There's a further uh, phase that will be going to government looking to, uh, with additional capital building, increase that uh, to 450. So, but by the end of next year, we'll have a 25% increase in our critical care uh, capacity at a cost of 52 million. So that's an enormous investment and a key enabler of uh, complex surgery, uh, trauma strategy, um, organ transplantation, and the management of cancer patients. So it's a, it's a, a, you know, a, a fantastic opportunity uh, for us all. And the other big uh, deficit, of course, is uh, in consultant numbers. Now, their biggest problem to consultant recruitment, in my view, is um, the, um, the current consultant contract and works are ongoing uh, to try and uh, uh, ensure that the new proposed launch of care contract will uh, be an appealing offering to highly qualified um, medical professionals. Um, but we have um, included in this budget a large number of consultant posts uh, for acute uh, hospitals. And once again, I'm very keen that those posts be placed in services where they're clearly identified with either a new service uh, development or the expansion of an existing service in a very meaningful way from a patient point of view. There's 20 million uh, for cancer with 12 million to support resumption of services, 33 million to support alternate uh, pathways of care, much uh, along the lines that um, Eamon has been discussing. Uh, there's good funding uh, to support equipment, uh, which is exciting. The National Rehabilitation Hospital will be fully funded and indeed there's funding for an additional uh, 40, uh, four, uh, 400 beds. And um, there is a, a 420 million have been assigned for access to care. And this is uh, to uh, support access to diagnostics, uh, at the deficit of which has been clearly uh, articulated this evening, um, but also um, uh, access to um, intermediate short term solutions uh, such as NTPF and using the private hospitals uh, to support uh, patient care pending the um, the investment and build of additional capacity to deliver on elective care. And there's six million have been uh, allocated uh, to support the trauma care uh, strategy, which will um, uh, should be sufficient to get it started. Um, uh, in a meaningful way over the next year. And um, so I, I guess that's uh, my, my update. I might just mention a couple of words if I have time about the private hospital uh, initiative uh, for the winter. So there's a, a procurement uh, process has been done with a panel in place, allowing access to uh, diagnostics, both from the hospitals or from the community. So that um, scheduled uh, uh, diagnostics can be diverted into the private sector, freeing up a hospital capacity for inpatient and emergency access. Um, and uh, in addition, there is um, uh, monies for NTPF type solutions within the private hospital, but more importantly, in my view, the opportunity to purchase capacity within the private hospital sector. And this would be a model where we would uh, 
uh, buy real estate, if you like, um, but the care will be delivered by public hospital teams uh, on their patients uh, within um, the private hospital sector. And some of that type of activity occurred during our um, so those uh, opportunities uh, will be available in terms of uh, funding um, if there's capacity uh, available in the private sector uh, uh, to deliver it in. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Vida. Uh, certainly there's an enormous amount of work going on in the background uh, and uh, you were able to uh, present all of these data, which is reflective of just the great strain that is uh, that is being placed on our acute services and everything you you, you have said uh, resonates and makes sense. There are a number of questions coming in, but I, I think in the interest of time, I think it best to uh, ask Aaron Glynn would he update us on uh, the uh, fracture liaison service. And then at, at the end, if we have time, we'll come back to some of the questions. Aaron, thanks. Thanks, Professor. You can hear me there, yeah? Yes. Great, okay. Uh, oh, thanks, Pauline. That's brilliant. So I'm just presenting uh, some work just on behalf of the National Orthopaedic Clinical Program, on behalf of Dave Moore. This is just one of the many things they're working on at the moment, is the setting up of a fracture liaison service. And I'm co-chair of that uh, steering committee with uh, Dr. Francis Dockery, who is a consultant geriatrician in Beaumont Hospital. Uh, next slide, please. So you may uh, recognize this lady, that's Peg Sayers, and she made most of our lives hell for two years while we were doing our leaving search. But um, we're talking about a, a pandemic in COVID, and unfortunately there's going to be a pandemic of old ladies uh, coming down the line. Our population is aging. Currently there's 300,000 people live in Ireland living with osteoporosis, and about 3,500 of these a year will sustain a hip fracture. And this has major implications for mortality, morbidity, 25% uh, of these patients will lose their independence and require permanent care. Um, and then there is also, uh, well, in addition to mortality, there it, it's well documented that up to 40% of hip fractures are preceded by another fracture, kind of like a sentinel fracture, if you will. So there's an opportunity there to identify patients who are at high risk of uh, hip fracture and step in and monitoring these. But when we take all fragility fractures together, and a fragility fracture can be defined as a fall from standing height. When we take all fragility fractures together, when you go through the hype data, it's found that there's more bed days taken up by elderly patients suffering from fractures than there is by acute coronary syndrome, MI, uh, and stroke combined. So it's a massive, massive use of our hospital resources. And if we do not act on this, these patients will simply overwhelm our ability to care for any other patient. Uh, next slide, please. Data from the 2018 National uh, Major Trauma Audit showed that about 58% of patients who sustain major trauma, this is major trauma where, with an injury severity score of greater than 16, 58% of these occur from a fall of less than two meters or a fall from standing height. So that's a massive amount of patients who are sustaining major trauma. And it's usually elderly patients because when they fall, they don't just break one bone, but they may break, break many bones. They may have pelvic fractures, they may have rib fractures, they may have spinal injuries. 46% uh, of patients sustaining major trauma are over 65 years of age. So that fits with the concept of them being fragility fractures. And 50% of these, of patients who are sustaining major trauma sustain a fall in their own home. So clearly there's a problem. And out of this data from 2018, it was decided to set up a fracture liaison database. Uh, next slide, please. So up until now, fragility fractures have been cared by, cared for by kind of a hodgepodge of uh, different specialists, mostly from uh, nursing care, physiotherapy, uh, Family physicians may or may not get involved. Orthopedics tend to look after the fracture, treat the fracture. Holistic care, you know, we tend to be a little bit snowed under with large volumes of trauma. So we don't really have the ability or the background in, in providing holistic care. And we rely on our geriatrician colleagues, but 
they may not have a, a, an especial interest in this or a background in, in treating bone health. Um, rheumatologists would, but again, they're sep maybe separated from seeing these patients directly. An endocrinologist would have the medical background in treating um, inadequate bone health, but again, they may not be aware of the, the volume of work out there. They may not have access to these patients. So the treatment to date of fragility fractures has been very fragmented, and there has been some efforts to address um, fragility fractures with multidisciplinary care, but this is really met with limited success. There's been efforts like the affinity program, you know, looking at falls and uh, bone health in elderly patients, and they've done fantastic work, but again, the impact hasn't really been there. Uh, next slide, please. So the current approach is taking, um, it, it's basically using quality improvement methods and looking at data to try and drive an improvement in patients suffering from fragility fractures. So taking a, a lead from the Irish hip fracture database, which I'll talk more about again, we see that applying standards and monitoring compliance with those standards can really improve quality of care for our patients. So based on the trauma audit, uh, the major trauma audit in 2018, it was decided to set up a fracture liaison service that we would identify patients who are at risk of major trauma or fragility fractures. So identify them and then investigate them appropriately with either DEXA scanning or other tools to monitor their, their bone density. And then to treat patients who are at high risk of secondary fractures, because these this is where you can have a major impact. It's through secondary prevention in high risk groups. So, you know, general population screening or general population treatment is not as effective as identifying the patients who are at high risk of that second fracture, which may be the hip fracture that will cause them to lose their independence or their life. So a, fr a fragility fracture uh, steering group was set up and this involves um, specialists from backgrounds in endocrinology, rheumatology, geri geriatrics, orthopedics, nursing and physiotherapy. And plans have been put in place to set up a database to look at the number of fragility fractures that, were, uh, that are there and to apply standards in the treatment thereof. And this is an evidence-based approach and it shows, as I said, that if you can identify the high-risk patients, that secondary prevention is most efficacious. So using the uh, wisdom of Peter Drucker who says if you can manage it or if you can measure it, you can manage it. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a little background on the Irish Hip Fracture Database. This was set up in 2016 and data was provided by all 16 trauma units where hip fractures are treated. Initially, they just looked at six key performance indicators such as time to admission, time to surgery, time to rehabilitation, you know, number of patients seen by a geriatrician, number of patients where bone health was commenced, uh, prevention of pressure sores, et cetera, et cetera. And in four years, we've shown a huge uh, improvement in care of hip fracture patients just by applying these standards. Next slide, please. So to date, the only national fracture liaison database is in the UK. And that was set up in 2016. And they're collecting data currently from 61 sites and their, um, their fourth annual report is produced there in January 2020. And looking at 58,000 patients in the UK, the problem again is kind of where we, we've touched on, on a lot of talks earlier on that Eamon and Vida both mentioned about lack of resources. And it's not a, a pure Irish problem. Like most of the data in the UK actually shows that they're not identifying the patients with uh, fragility fractures. They're not uh, treating them in a timely manner. They're not being appropriately investigated. So it's not a unique Irish problem to, to suffer from lack of resources. But by identifying that there is a problem and drawing attention to it, we're hoping that care will improve in due course by setting up an Irish database. Could you get the next slide there, please? So these are the key performance indicators looked at by the UK uh, Fracture Liaison Service Database. And we're modifying these slightly, but what they're looking at is data completeness. So obviously the, that the data is complete uh, from every unit, that they're identifying about 80% of, of expected number of fractures. And they found that a crude uh, method of identifying the number of fractures you should be seeing is that you should be seeing five fragility fractures for every hip fracture. So in Ireland, we know that we see 3,700 hip fractures per year. So we should be identifying over 18,000 fragility fractures and treating these patients. 
Uh, spinal fractures can often be missed, and there's um, there's software for for picking these up on, on previous scans, and you know there's different companies doing that. Um, again, making sure the patients are investigated by DEX in a timely manner, that they undergo falls assessment, that they start bone therapy, uh, that they go undergo falls assessment within an appropriate time frame, and that they're followed up to make sure that they're compliant with their therapy, um, and they want to make sure that they're started on bone therapy within 16 weeks and they follow up their patients at a year to make sure that they're still compliant with medication because a lot of these medications are um you know you're dealing with elderly patients so compliance could be an issue they may be forgetful uh, a lot of the oral um bisphosphonates can have gi side effects um and then you know a lot of uh, a lot of the therapies also involve patients coming into hospital for a, a biannual infusion and you know when wards are swamped with other work for example covid that kind of thing can just go by the by so compliance is a huge problem um can we get the next slide there please so what kind of success have we had to or what kind of progress have we made well as i said the steering group was appointed in march 2018 uh or sorry the the, the fls was set up in march 2018 and then the steering group was appointed in july of that year Funding has been secured from industry uh, for a two-year pilot study, and we're hoping after a two-year pilot study that the HSE will take this on under the auspice of NOCA as uh, uh, an audit that is uh, set up, that it's feasible, and that it's showing that data is coming back from units. And we're not going to see cost saving initially from this. This isn't a quick, um, you know, you won't see quick gains from this. It's only really after a number of years that the data comes back to show that there is a cost saving in uh, preventing these fractures. So it takes a little bit of time for, for that to come back. So certainly by the end of a two year pilot program, we won't be able to show massive savings, but looking at all the international data and all the results from fracture smaller fracture liaison services, there is good data to be found that when you extrapolate that data on the national level, that significant cost savings can be made. Uh, we're very grateful to the RCSI for agreeing to be the data controller for this project. And what I've learned about GDPR and um, data management over the past few months, <laughs> certainly an eye opener for North, coming from North Vedic background. Uh, we've secured IT services from uh, Crown in the UK, and that has implications for, for Brexit, unfortunately. But because they're behind the UK database, they were, you know, they had a ready-made product to give us, and it was we were able to get that quite cheaply. Obviously, if this was to become a national uh, database, that uh, it would have to go out for tender. Uh, we've done scoping work looking at it, the number of expected fractures we're supposed to see and data has been analyzed by the health, Out health outcomes research uh, center under the care of uh, prof jan Sorensen in your society we've agreed our data set we're shortening down the number of kpis we're probably going to use eight or nine as opposed to the 11 we're using in the uk uh, kenny franks who has done a lot of work with noca in the past has been appointed our project manager and uh, we're currently engaged in two things. We're currently engaged in facilities audit with the 16 uh, trauma sites, looking to see what kind of personnel are in place. Um, and looking to see what resources they have to, to upload data to a database. And we're hoping to select five sites for a pilot study, for the two-year pilot study. The hip fracture database um, has been very successful, as I said, over the past number of years. And most, if not all units now, treating hip fractures would have a hip fracture liaison nurse um, who's able to input the data for the uh, Irish hip fracture database. So it's a little bit more challenging to get additional resources, to get an additional nurse to look at bone health. And because we're looking at fragility fractures, we're excluding hip fractures from this because we want to, we're not trying to improve care of hip fracture patients, but we're trying to prevent hip fractures altogether. And we would need a dedicated uh, bone health nurse to work on identifying these patients and making sure they're referred for treatment, uh, uploading the data. And we'd also need a, a falls assessment specialist nurse because it's not just simply strength and balancing, although that's a key part of it, but there's also issue with uh, medication management and uh, you know testing uh, eyesight, home visits to make sure that there you know, isn't uh, a home environment that's conducive to a fall. So there's a lot of work behind that. Uh, but we're hopeful that uh, this may roll in the future. Can I have the next slide there, please? So as I mentioned, um, 
our challenges are the same as uh, Eamon Rogers outlined and as Vita's touched on with the uh, just that we simply don't have the resources to to engage in a, an ambitious project like this as things currently stand. Any of our uh, hip fracture care nurses have currently been reassigned during uh, COVID pandemic, so we're not even getting data on a lot of hip fracture patients. Um, there's also a challenge with in terms of uh, IT um, uh, frameworks because a lot of units where there are nascent uh, fracture liaison service databases, a lot of them have committed to using existing software and they don't really want to change to a, a, another um, another IT system for a pilot study, which uh, can be a little bit frustrating, especially as a lot of their database, they're not even able to retrieve their own data. So, you know, they're, they're using it, but they're not able to retrieve their data. So yeah, that's, that's another challenge for us. Uh, I mentioned GDPR setting up an audit. I mean, NOCA have been quite, um, right, NOCA have been extremely helpful to us. And I've mentioned Colette Tully and Breed Moran, especially have been very, very helpful for us for providing some legal background to audit and our responsibilities in that regard. And uh, Kieran Ryan, as I said, has been very uh, supportive as well. But there's still some concern about the use of data in a non, in a, a, an audit where consent is not given. Uh, even though it's not research and we will not be publishing research from this, you know, there's still issues with regard to retention of data under GDPR and, and that's somewhat challenging. And that's compounded by the issue of Brexit then because we're using a, a UK um, IT company, even though we won't be transferring identifiable patient data over there, there's still the issue of a, a UK company holding Irish patients' data. So there's challenges there as well. There's also a little bit of a challenge with the HSE are reluctant to roll out a service that they may not be able to stand over in the future. So if we're collecting data and we're showing that we can reduce number of fractures, but then if they feel there isn't long term funding for this, then they don't want to be in the position where they're withdrawing a service. So, um, you know, the, the, we're still negotiating to, to get this uh, fully approved and adopted. Can I have the next slide, please? But I think overall there are significant gains to be made, both in terms of improving quality of care for patients with fragility fractures by preventing further fractures, by preventing hip fractures that can cause morbidity, mortality, and that are using significant number of hospital beds. So not only are we improving the quality of life for these patients, but there's also significant cost implications, both in terms of hospital resources and also community resources. And I think slaunchy care would really embrace the um, idea of uh, keeping patients in the community. So we're hoping by getting some investment for our patients and for this database that we can reduce the number of fractures and keep patients at home in the community. So we're hoping to get some uh, traction under the uh, both the National Trauma Strategy and also under Slauncher Care. And just to give an example of, of the data, uh, that's just to show what, what can be achieved. Um, McClellan and colleagues did a study in 2011 and they showed that if the data from looking at regional FLSs were applied to the whole of the UK, that they could save £21,000 per 1,000 patients, that they could prevent 18 fractures per 1,000 patients, 11 of the, which doesn't sound like a lot, but 11 of these are hip fractures, which are a major, major uh, use of resources. And if this was applied on a national level across the whole of the UK, that they could save £9.7 million uh, pounds sterling per year. So. There are significant cost savings to be made from that. But as I said, it takes a little bit of time before you see those cost savings. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention this late hour, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Aaron, thank you. I mean, I think you've made a persuasive case for an ounce of prevention is worth several pounds or uh, thousands of pounds in, in cure. Um, we've gone a bit over time. Vida, I'm very grateful to you for answering some of the questions on the chat. Uh, and um, I think in the interest of everybody getting to their evening meal, we'll probably bring it to a close. I'm really appreciative of, as are I'm sure all of us uh, who have uh, attended, uh, to our contributors, Ken Mealy, Eamon Rogers, Vida Hamilton and uh, Aaron who's just uh, spoken to us. So I think we, we should call it a, an evening. Uh, Kieran, are there any housekeeping messages? 
No, that's up to the immigration. All right, and uh, Vida, best of luck on managing the uh, the levers of power in the HSE. Uh, just make sure that you're looking after all of our interests. I'm sure you are. So good night to everybody and thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.